have it set for the boys. Boy, it's the 25th. Is it the 25th? Yeah, I, okay. I have it set for 24 to remind everybody. So it's next it. Sunday, lunch here. Yeah. All right. Next Sunday, lunch here. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 20 this morning. Matthew chapter 20. All right. I'm going to pray once more. Lord, help me to preach the message that you want me to preach this morning. Help me to say what I should say. Help me get out of your way. Help people to see you, see Jesus in the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard. Whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? He saith unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first men first came, they supposed they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, Though these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that is thine, take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is Jesus talking about in this parable? Is he talking about uh, minimum wage rates? Heaven. Okay, <clears throat> so for the time period, a penny a day was a fair wage. Now, if someone says, hey, you're going to come out and work in my yard all day, I say, well, I'm going to pay you a dollar, nobody would take it. But if I said, hey, I'll pay you a hundred, well, probably a little bit more these days, I'll pay you $150, come work all day in my yard. Most people, if they're needing a job, would take that. It's a fair wage. However, Everybody got the same wage. Why? Was it not fair that what the was what the first group of laborers paid not fair? It was. They agreed. So everything after that was what? What do you call it? If if Noah, I've got people working at my house and they're chopping down trees. I got I got an acre of, of trees in my backyard, and I've had my little brother-in-law come down and chop, chop trees. You can't use my chainsaw, it's too dangerous, so you gotta do it by hand. And I've had you chopping down trees for 12 hours in this Florida heat. You and I agreed on price, say about 150 bucks. Well, I have my little brother-in-law come over. He works kind of a little bit for like 30 minutes at the end of the day. And I pay him 150 bucks. What would you think about that? Not fair. Probably not fair. Why not? He didn't work for it. See, we think of this terms in fairness, right? <clears throat> I like to be treated fairly. If I do the same job as my coworker, which very rarely happens, I would like to be paid the same. If I do better, I'd like to be paid more. I don't think it's fair if I work all day and someone sits at their desk all day that they get paid the same. But that's the agreement that I made, right? I also had the opportunity to sit and do nothing and could have gotten paid. But that's not the agreement that I made. So do you realize that we have this concept of fairness? 
No, it's pretty, pretty obvious to you what the concept of fairness is, right? You should be compensated according to your level of effort, okay? We like that when we work, we can be compensated to our level of effort. But in this instance, if I were to pay my little brother-in-law more, is that because you're bad at your job or because I'm bad or because I'm generous with my money? See, if, if you, you and I had not agreed, then I'd be in the wrong. But the, but the agreement was for a certain amount. So what this is, is a generosity towards everybody. Some people worked half the day, some people worked a portion of the day, some people worked almost not at all. So it wasn't about, so Noah in the story, was it about how hard they worked? No. What was it about? The agreement. It was about the generosity of the Lord of the vineyard, was it not? It was about not fairness or justice, but the idea was if you come work for me, I'll pay you. Okay? Now, people like to think that life is fair and balanced. Noah, again, you're pretty young. Is life always fair? <laughs> Absolutely not. It irks us when life's not fair, but life's not fair. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know, where is the concept of fairness in the Bible? Anybody know? It's not a trick question. It is kind of a trick question, I guess it is. Do you know that, that God doesn't talk about life and our, and our sin in terms of fair? Right. It doesn't exist in the Bible. The word fair is in the Bible, but they're talking about people that are pretty. The man was fair. doesn't mean that he was just. It means that he was, you know, good looking. Do you know that God doesn't have a concept of fair, Brother Jones? He doesn't go, oh, here's what's fair. Let me give you what's fair. Do you know what would, Brother Glenn, if God gave us what was fair, what we deserved, what would we receive? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I'm so, all of a sudden, not so big a fan of fair anymore, am I? If you realize what you deserve, you don't want what's fair. Do you know it? No. You want the generosity of the one dealing out payment. You want the good will and good nature of God. Okay? Not gives grace equally. Ma'am? Not gives grace equally. God gives grace equally. All right? To so turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. So we talk about fairness as if we want justice. Okay? Justice would be the, the just reward for our deed, which would be hell. However, we do see God as a just God. So our sins were paid for. Who paid for? So because God accepted Jesus' payment, he can't accept anything from us. You, you ever, and it, it happens, it's rare here in this country, it's more uh, common in other countries, do you know that you can bribe a judge? It happens. I don't know of anywhere happening locally on the internet. I do know that I've heard stories in the Philippines, it's very common, that if you know the judge and you wanted a certain outcome, you can just buy it. What do we call that? There's a word for that. Corruption. Thank you. <laughs> we call that corruption. Yeah. We, we, we call that uh, bribery. bribery. And and it's a, what is corruption and bribery? It's a crime. Okay. So God being a just and righteous judge only ever accepted one payment. So therefore, we can still have fairness and justice and not go to hell. Why? Because Christ fairly and justly paid for us. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. 
Philippians chapter 3. Now, Noah, who wrote Philippians, the letter to Philippians? Don't know? Can you help me out, brother? Points go to Miss Christie. Uh, no, not. <laughs> wasn't Philip. <laughs> to the church of Philippi. It's a decent guess. It's a decent guess. To the church of Philippi, it was Paul, okay? Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. What does he mean? If, you're, if you think you're working hard for God, I've got you beat. That's what he's saying. Paul says, if you think you're working really hard for your salvation, I'm doing more than you are. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In other words, I did everything I was supposed to do. I did everything my parents told me to do. I did everything my peers told me to do. I did everything the law told me I was supposed to do. All right? Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In other words, I had, to, I had to dump all that. We had a, a series about uh, Jesus' sermons. And one of the, the very first Sermon on the Mount, what does he tell the Jews? He says, your religion isn't going to help. Dump your religion. Here's what, here's what Paul realized. I had to dump what I had. Those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, and the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay? So, he had a pretty good resume, religiously. Paul had all the boxes checked. I was born into the right family. My parents made the right decisions. Can you, as an eight-day-old eight child, choose to be circumcised? No. So his parents made the right decisions for him. And Hebrew of the Hebrews says, I got everything you say I got to have, and none of that's worth anything. Noah, you collect dung? No. What do we do? We get rid of it, right? Why? Nobody wants it. Maybe it's fertilizer, <clears throat> but like, it's of no value to you. That's the reason your body gets rid of it. It's of no value to you. That is what Paul equates his whole life to. It was as valuable to me as dung compared to what I now know about Jesus. Folks, before anyone trusts Christ, they come to the same place where they realize that everything they've ever done right, quote-unquote, their whole life has no value to them eternally. I've met preachers that they've come to conferences and they talk to, to different pastors and they hear the gospel for the first time, really. They would hear the truth of the gospel and say, well, that's, that's not what I've been taught and that's not what I teach. And some of these preachers had been preaching a really long time. 30 or 40 years in preaching a different gospel. And I've heard this exact phrase. I believe that, but if I did, I'd have to throw away my whole ministry. So his ministry was more important to him than the truth of the gospel. And you, I heard him make that choice. Folks, Paul is warning us. That the righteousness of the law isn't worth anything compared to Jesus Christ and to dump it. He worked hard his whole life to be good so he could go to heaven. Just like the, the laborers worked hard the whole day. But at the end of the day, they realized it wasn't how hard they worked. It was the generosity of the one who paid. Turn to John chapter 8. Turn to John chapter 8. 
in verse 43. Now, Brother Glenn, what's going on here in John chapter 8? I'm going to give it some context. Rather than read the whole chapter, which you're welcome to do, don't just take my word for it, but what's the context here in John chapter 8? Who's talking? Jesus is one of them. Who's, who's he talking to? The Pharisees. Okay. Who did Paul say he was before he met Christ? A Pharisee of the Pharisees. Yep. A Hebrew of Hebrews touching the law of Pharisees. Okay. So these are the type of people he's talking to. Now, what were the Pharisees famous for? I'll pick on somebody other than Noah. Miss Christian. Who, what were the Pharisees famous for in their day? What are they? Keeping the law, right? They were the, the Baptist preachers in a three-piece suit, right? They kept the law. They behaved themselves. I went back to the church I grew up in a couple years ago for a funeral. I hadn't been there in a long time. And I met a man that knew me when I was little, when I was real little, when I was growing up. He ran into me, and he smiled, and he shook my hand. And he was talking to me a little bit. He never met my wife. So he shakes my wife's hand. He goes, ma'am, I don't know anything about your husband now. But when he was a little boy, he was a good little boy. He came to church and he listened and he behaved himself. <clears throat> he said, that's what I know about him. I said, oh, thanks. So I behaved myself when I was a child. I went to church, stayed out of trouble, didn't drink or, you know, run around. And, you know, was thankfully mostly ignored by girls when I was real little, so I didn't have any trouble there but you know that that testimony of, of me being quote unquote good that does me more harm in my finding salvation than it does me good because what if I thought what if I thought well I can go to heaven I've been real good I've been a good little boy so many people think well I've been a good little boy a good little girl God will let me into heaven. No, I had to let all of that go. I had to realize that that was as valuable to me eternally as dumb. Yeah. And it was only Christ. And he's talking to people that grew up like me. He's talking to Pharisees. People that grew up behaving themselves, supposedly, at least publicly. For the record, I've done plenty of stupid stuff. I just won't tell you all about it. I'm smart enough not to tell you how stupid I am. All right, let's in uh, verse forty three, John chapter eight, verse forty three. Why ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God, he, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So Jesus is telling the Pharisees, the religious elite, the rulers of Israel, you are of your father, the devil. You are all lost. And I'm telling you, you are. And you can't even hear me say it. These people, these men, who are known for their religious zeal, have God in the flesh telling them how wrong they are. And do they go, oh, thank you for correcting me. Is that what they say? <clears throat> then answered the Jews and said unto him, this is their, this is their really smart, uh, mature, well thought out response. Say we not well, that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? You're a half breed and devil possessed. That's what, that, that was the best thing to come up with. You're a half breed and devil possessed. Jesus answered, I have not a devil. <laughs> But I honor my Father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if the man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. 
Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death? What are they saying? They say, well, Abraham died? What are you talking about? Art thou greater, in verse 53, art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Ye have not known him. But I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, and so passed by. These Pharisees were zealous students of the law of Moses. So zealous, in fact, that they missed the whole point. There was the whole point standing in front of them, trying, begging, pleading with them to understand that all of their keeping the law had just caused them to think that they were the ones that had bought their own salvation. Folks, we see it in the Bible, and yet it still happens every day. In this country, all over the world, people think that they are earning their own salvation through the actions of their life. The only thing that you can do to help move towards salvation is read this. Amen. This is what moves you towards salvation, not not coming to church. I encourage you to come to church so that you learn out of here, but that doesn't help you. I know people that sat in church their whole lives, they'll, they'll die and go to hell. Because they thought, I just need to be here. There are people that are nice to people. You know there are people that are nicer than us? Yeah. I mean, there are people that are nicer than us. They go around, they spend all their money trying to help the poor. They'll do anything you ask them to do. They spend their whole day thinking about how to help other people. I spent most of my day trying to figure out how to help me, to be honest. There are people that are nicer than us. They'll die and go to hell because they think that being nice is what buys them eternity. All right? Now I got a, a, a little exercise I want us to do. We'll walk across the board here a little bit. So I'm going to pretend that there are three circles, y'all. Y'all know what a hula hoop is, right? Y'all play. With, if you ever play with a hula hoop, raise your hand. If you can successfully do a hula hoop, raise your hand. All right, that's, that's about, a, about, a, about a fair minute. All right, so I want you to imagine that there's like a, a circle on the floor here, about hula hoop size, right? I'm going to put one there, and one here, and one over here. So i got three imaginary circles. Y'all's imagination working this morning, y'all awake, right? Okay, three imaginary circles. And this one, we're going to put bad stuff. We're going to put sin. We're going to use this circle to, to categorize bad stuff. So give me some stuff to put in this circle. I'll give you an example. Push old ladies in the well. That's a bad thing. We'll put that in there. Stealing. What if, stealing. Good. That's in the circle. What else you got? Lying. Lying. We're going to put that in the circle. What else you got? Lust. Lust. We're going to put that in the circle. What else you got? Lying. Killing. Lying. Some bad stuff. What else you got? Anything else? Not taking care of. Not taking care of your family. Not not uh, not praying to God. Not trusting God. We're, bad stuff. I'm, I'm talking about the things that the world says is really bad. Lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, these things that people say are really, really bad. We're going to put those stuff in the bad circle, right? You don't want me to do any of these things. You don't want me to kill people. You don't want me to steal from you. You don't want me to, to, to beat you up. You don't want me to be mean to your children, whatever, bad stuff. Okay, this is circle number one. Circle number two, we're going to put good stuff. Y'all give me some good stuff. What goes in this, what goes in this circle? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a story. Reading your Bible. It's a good thing. Being nice to people. What else you got? Charity. Charity is good. You should, Bible says you should be charitable to people. What else goes in the circle? Give me some good stuff. Honor your parents. Honor your parents. It's important. You got to take care of your parents. God says to you. Good stuff. What else you got? Being thankful. Being thankful. Good stuff. Obeying the commandments. Obey, try and obey the commandments. People think that they do. <clears throat> love thy okay. neighbor. Sir? Thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor. You know, love thy neighbor is the first thing that Jesus said to do was the most important. That loving other people was important. That's good. Anything else? Loving God. 
Loving God, good stuff. Going to church, reading your Bible. Putting some money in the offering plate. All these are good things. Nothing wrong with these things. No one says don't do these things, right? Okay? So the third circle over here, we're going to leave blank for a second. So I want you to imagine a timeline. Y'all know what a timeline is? Y'all in school, right? No, you, you can see the timeline in school. So this is the beginning of your life. Grace's timeline is like here, right? Oakland. So when you're born, you're born in your parents' family, the very beginning. You grow up a little bit, about Noah's age here, you hit adulthood, you get married, you know, you have kids, <coughs> you go all the way to the end. Life ends over here, boom, death. It's your timeline. Okay? So if someone is born, they come here and they trust Christ before they die, then they go to heaven, right? That's, that's what the Bible says. And most people believe that you have to move from circle one, because they're like, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Who did something stupid when they were a teenager? Anybody? Am I the only person? No, it says no. He's never done anything stupid his whole life. All right. Do something stupid when you were a teenager, right? So you do bad stuff. <laughs> didn't, wait, didn't wait that long. And then most people believe you move from circle one into circle two, and that's what gets you to heaven. You ride circle two all the way the rest of your life until you die. If you stay in, second, if you stay in circle two, you're good. That's what so many people believe. Now, Brother Glenn, you've seen this before. What's in circle three? Right. Anything else? Nothing. Nothing else. Circle three contains Jesus Christ and absolutely nothing else. So before you go to heaven, you'll come to circle one. You realize, man, I'm a mess. I mess up a lot. I sin. And then you'll come to circle two. I'm like, okay, I'm going to clean myself up a little bit. And then before you go to heaven, you'll realize that circle two helps you get to heaven no more than circle one. Y'all realize that? Right. Now, we like people better in circle two than we like the people in circle one. I don't like people that steal cars or, or murder people. Those people I don't want to hang out with. I'm not going to ask you to be my friend. Do you know that circle two doesn't help if you don't have circle three? Circle two doesn't do anything for you. You have to be born, realize, come to the age of accountability. Now, that, that term is not in the Bible, but we know that at a certain age, a child becomes accountable to God for their soul. Right? God doesn't send babies to hell. But he sends adults to hell. So somewhere in there, <clears throat> depending on the child, I think, you could reach the age of accountability. And then you trust Christ to take you to heaven. And you die and you spend eternity with Jesus. People think moving from circle one to circle two is salvation. No, no, no. Salvation is when you move from circle two to circle three. And you realize that Christ is the only thing that matters. Let's look at a couple of examples. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Verse 16. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? What's he looking for? What circle is he looking for? He's looking for circle two. It's not a man that's in circle one. This is a circle two guy. He said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He says he's not in circle two. Isn't that what he says? He says, there's none good. You're in circle one, buddy. But if you want to go, to go to heaven, keep the commandments. Oh, Jesus, I'm in circle two. Verse 18, he says, he says unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. False witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? He says, I got this covered, Jesus. You don't understand how much I got this covered. I'm good. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that say, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. <clears throat> you notice the last thing Jesus told him to do was love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, he was very wealthy, and there were poor people around him. He wasn't really doing that. Nope. So Jesus said, okay, the last thing I told you to do, you told me you're doing. Go sell everything and follow me. Well, no, no. I don't need Jesus. I'm fine here in circle two. I'm fine here with my good works. I'm the best person I know. Where, where's the rich young, young ruler? What circle is he in? Circle two. He's in good works. And he's, and he's decided to stay in good works. He died and went to hell. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Find verse 26. Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at another example. Look at an example. See, too many people get stuck in circle two. So, too many people get stuck in the law. They get stuck in works. They get stuck in this, this is what I need to do. There's a reason it's a circle, right? Because it just keeps going. There's no end to it. There's no end to how much bad you can do. There's no end to how much good you can do. There's no end to how much Jesus has done. Acts chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All right, chapter 8, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south <clears throat> unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Okay, and he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he should come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb before lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? What is the eunuch looking for? The eunuch had a question. Who is this Philip, I'm sure, reading the being a preacher goes, Man, I'm so glad you asked. Amen. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. See the eunuch, what was his business? What was he doing? What, what did Philip interrupt him from doing? He was reading the scripture. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He was coming back. He was doing what he was supposed to do. He was doing the thing that, that a believer should do. He was in the second circle. He went out there causing trouble. He was in the second circle. But he wasn't content there. He was looking for something. He was looking for Jesus. In verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, 
What saved this man? Believe. Believe. Not the baptism. Not his good work. He believed. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way, rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So here's an example of a man that knew that he was no good here. He didn't have it. He was looking for Jesus. And before Philip left, what circle was he in? The unit. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm going to ask an important question. Do you have to move from circle one to circle two to get to circle three? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. The thief on the cross. Had he changed his ways? Had he had a chance to clean up his life? No, he's being executed for crimes. He's in the middle of paying for his horrible deeds. And there were two there, and one said, nah, there's no point. And the other one said, aha, I see Jesus. Folks, Amen. you don't have to get circled through. <laughs> you don't have to clean up your life, stop sinning, do good to get to Jesus. The law teaches us that we need Jesus. Not that we have to be good to go to heaven. The law teaches us that we deserve hell. But that Jesus paid all of it for us. Folks, no matter where you are on this life timeline here, we all hope that we've got plenty of room on this side. We all hope there's plenty of room before we hit the wall over there, right? We don't know. We might not have much time. But before you come to the end of this life, you have to come to the end of yourself and realize that there's no salvation in your works. That your reward is not reckoned of, you don't want the reward reckoned of, of death. You want the reward reckoned of grace. Amen. Of the generosity of the one that paid for it. Now some of us may work a little longer than others. We're not working our way to heaven. Right. Jesus did all the work that was required on the cross of Calvary. The work is finished. And our responsibility, what, we're, what God's looking at us to do, is to trust him to take us to heaven. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the people here, Lord. I pray that this message will stick in the hearts and minds of those that hear it. Lord, that will look to you, that will hear you, and will take this message to our friends and family and community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.